should we have a conversation? We should. Let, let's yeah. talk about <laughs> tithing, shall we? Yeah. One of the the reasons we find it important to tithe, whether you know through the highs or the lows, is it's what you're supposed to do. It, it's something that has proven to continue to work. Mm-hmm. We tithe whether we're both fully employed yeah. and doing well or... Right? Oh my goodness. Or, I mean, when we don't have money, yeah. we still tithe. Well, and sometimes because we know that it works and because like we've put complete faith and trust in God to provide for everything, oftentimes we'll be like, okay, we don't know how this is going to work, so we're going to tithe and we're going to give a little more, and then like things always work out. Right. Yeah, I mean, God always shows up. We're not in control. God's in control. So we kind of have to take that back seat of, let's just see how this plays out right. and completely trust that, that God's got it. Just got to have faith. Uh, why not have faith in your money and what God can do? Let's give him 10% and let him be in control. I'm Nancy. And I'm Brian. And we're putting God first. divisiveness. It's persuasive and it's contagious. We can feel ourselves be pulled into divisiveness. But last week we looked at how Paul found himself in a church divided and really a people divided. This week we look at the letter to the Corinthians that Paul wrote. You'll recognize this. This is Corinthians, the scriptures that we hear at weddings. Like Paul, we find ourselves around more hate and fear than love right now. But in these days, if we can press into Paul's words and his example, we will begin to see people who are willing to do for love what they would never do for religion. Let's continue to follow Paul's lead and his example. When we left off last time, Paul had been acquitted by Solanus, which ended up being bittersweet. He'd avoid the death penalty, but would suffer unforeseen consequences as a result. Solanus was assassinated, and Paul, he became a target. After a quick, unproductive visit to Corinth, Paul and Sosthenes made their way to Ephesus, where he'd spent several days dictating what would be his longest letter to that point. It's a letter we now know as the biblical book of 1 Corinthians. A letter that, quite honestly, as far as Paul knew, in light of the persecution he'd faced and that he foresaw he might still face, could have been his last. I wanna talk about that in a message we're calling The Formula. So with all the uncertainty and unrest in Ephesus, knowing he was writing into a situation of division and in spite of his frustration with that division, Paul pressed on with the truth. And he begins his letter with love and gratitude. And he does that because gratitude is a great deterrent to frustration. And because he understood love isn't just compromise, sometimes it requires confrontation. That reminds me of a line my pastor used to repeat often. He'd say, you can say anything you want to someone as long as you say it in love. So Paul said, I always thank God for you because of the grace of God that's been given to you in Christ Jesus, that you were enriched in him in every way in all speech and all knowledge. In this way, the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you so that you don't lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. He'll also strengthen you to the end so that you'll be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful. You were called by him into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. <laughs> but once he'd established his love and gratitude for them, he gets into the purpose for this letter, correction. Having heard about the division in the church caused by factions created from their loyalty, some to him, some to Apollos, others to Peter, and then this group of outliers who had an allegiance to no apostle, 
He says, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree that there be no divisions among you, but that you'd be united in the same mind and the same judgment. I mean, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I mean, I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one may say that they were baptized in my name. It's like he's saying, don't get it twisted. This isn't about me, it's not about Apollos, it's not about Peter, for Christ didn't send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not even with words of eloquent wisdom, even though of all the people who could have stood on or depended upon his wisdom and intellect, it was Paul. But he knew that by doing that, the cross of Christ would be emptied of its power. Paul pressed the point and he emphasized as if to lift the whole discussion at once to a higher plane. He emphasized the stark contrast between the world's philosophies which seek goodness by the application of human thought and effort and the gospel which philosophy and common sense regarded as ludicrous. He said, God in his wisdom made it impossible for men to know him by means of their wisdom. Instead, God decided to save those who believe by means of the foolish message that we preach. Jews, they want miracles for proof, and the Greeks, they look for wisdom. As for us, we proclaim Christ on the cross, a message that is both offensive to the Jews and nonsense to the Gentiles. But for those whom God has called, both Jews and Gentiles, this message is Christ, who is the power of God and the wisdom of God. The foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger. By the time Paul had unfolded a long argument, he made it plain that no man could discover God by way of his intellect. And even if Paul had known what marvels of knowledge would emerge the next 2,000 years, that the human mind and anatomy were infinitely complex, and that the universe is so vast that the earth, it spins as a mere speck in space, he'd have said the same thing. He'd have considered it ironic that the more man discovered the insignificance of our planet, the more highly we would rate ourselves, that we would somehow convince ourselves that we can explain everything away without even making reference to God. So Paul would remind them, and ultimately us, that humanity, we, no, nothing. So he forged on. He said, the wisdom we speak is the wisdom of God, secret, hidden, which God prepared for our glory before time began, which none of the rulers of this age has known. For if they had known, they would never have crucified the Lord of glory. The man who's merely natural, he doesn't receive the things of the Spirit of God. They're ridiculous to him. He's not able to know them because they can only be understood by a spiritual man. He then quotes the great prophet Isaiah, for who has known the mind of God? Who is it that can instruct him? He reminds them, though, that we, we have the mind of Christ. And knowing that the Corinthians would be forced to read this letter out loud to a crowd, Paul disposed of the question of who they should be loyal to by showing them that apostles or messengers are just spokesmen, simply servants. He said, uh, I planted, Apollos watered, but God is the one who gave the increase. None of you should be proud of one man and despise the other. I mean, who made you superior to others? And that verse, it reminds me of the debates that we have going on now in the midst of this pandemic. It reminds me of the separation that those debates are creating between us. And so Paul says, didn't God give you everything you have? Then how can you brag as if what you have weren't a gift? And then interestingly, Paul slips into like this little run of irony that comes really close to sarcasm. He says, you're rich already. Without us, you reign as kings. I mean, in contrast, us apostles, we're fools for Christ's sake. But, but you, you're wise in Christ. We're weak, but you're strong. You're held in honor, but us, we're held in disrepute. 
He then goes on and describes the abusive treatment that he'd endured on his missionary tour, but then, as if he catches himself, or maybe Sosthenes mentions his tone, Paul says, I mean, I'm not saying all this to make you ashamed, but to bring you, my dearest children, to your senses. For though you have countless teachers, you don't have many fathers. You don't have many men who will love you and discipline you. Not many men who will speak the truth in love. So Paul, he assumes that role. And he spends his letter confronting arrogance and political posturing, spiritual abuse and false religious practices, sexual immorality and the distortion of love. He says, I'm saying this because I want to help you. I'm not trying to put restrictions on you. Instead, I want you to do what's right. I want you to do what's proper and give yourselves completely to the Lord's service without any reservations. And he reminds them, he's not anxious for his own advantage, but for the advantage of everyone else. He wants them all to be saved. So he brings them back to unity. And he says, some of us are Jews, some are Gentiles, some are slaves, and some are free but we've all been baptized into one body by one spirit and we all share the same spirit. I mean, even though we're different parts of the body, he said, we all have a necessary role and we all have individual gifts, whether that be wisdom or knowledge, faith or healing, miracles or prophecy, speaking in tongues or interpreting tongues. He said, we're all different, but we all need each other. If one part of the body suffers, we all suffer. But if one part flourishes, we all flourish. So Paul says, treat each other with love and gratitude, grace and encouragement. And then again, he brings it back to love. He does that because he wanted to dispel the view of love that had taken over Corinth a love that had been distorted, a love that was carnal, that was self-seeking, that was self-serving. The city was obsessed with eros, this purely sexual love. But he wanted to leave them with a true understanding of that higher, peculiar love that was unique to Christian believers, an agape love. If he could just convey the meaning of that kind of love, they have an example to aim at. They'd have a formula from which to live. So he said, if I speak in the tongues of man or of angels, but don't have love, I'm only a resounding gong, a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but I don't have love, I'm nothing. If I give all that I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardships so that I might boast, but I don't have love, I gain nothing. And he leaned back and he contemplated how to describe this Christian love. And he thought of the many qualities that he'd experienced in Jesus. That Jesus, he was patient and kind. He was never jealous, not possessive. He envied no one. He wasn't boastful or anxious to impress. He was never arrogant, proud, rude, or discourteous. He didn't insist on his own way, pursue selfish advantage, or claim his rights, which was evidenced in his willingness to receive the cross. He wasn't touchy, irritable, or quick to take offense. He didn't brood on injuries, bear a grudge, show resentment, gloat over people's sins, or condone injustice. Instead, he loved goodness and always took part in the truth. He was slow to expose and could overlook faults. There was no limit to his endurance, no end to his willingness to trust, and no diminishing his hope. And with the face of that perfect love filling his mind, Paul knew the formula had just been formed. He surged forward and resumed dictating, delivering the best known of all his works, a prose poem that besides its profound spiritual value allows Paul to rank among the greatest masters of all literature. He said, love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it is not rude, it is not self-seeking, it's not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love takes no pleasure in evil, but it rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. It never fails. 
And I was reading those verses over again this week, and for some reason I felt this draw to read it in the King James Version. And when I did, I was moved by its literary beauty. You can't rush through the King James. You have to slow your speech. You have to focus on every word because it's so different than our natural form of speech. And so it says, Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. Doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil. Rejoices not in iniquity, but in the truth. Beareth all things, believeth all things. Hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth. And as I read that, I thought, I wonder why they changed the word love to charity. So I did some study and, and I discovered that the translators made the switch because in their context, the word charity encapsulated any loving action that didn't depend on the love being returned. And it hit me, that's it. That's the formula. Loving people with a love that doesn't depend on them loving me back. A love that's patient and kind, that doesn't envy or boast, isn't proud, rude, self-seeking, or easily angered, that doesn't keep record of wrongs or take pleasure in evil, but instead rejoices in the truth, that bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. But most importantly, never ever fails. And friends, it's a love that may be more necessary now than it's ever been. Because with all the uncertainty and unrest we're under, it's urgent that we recognize and realize that yes, we're all different, but we all need each other. If one of us suffers, we all suffer, but if one of us flourishes, we all flourish. So what if we just treated each other with love and gratitude, grace, and encourage that higher, uniquely Christian version of love called agape. I wonder, can you do that? More importantly, will you do that? Because if you will, my friend, you will have just found the formula. The formula, first and foremost, before we go any further, is that every one of us needs to make a saving proclamation. In the church world, we, we call it getting saved or salvation, but every one of us in our lifetime need to recognize who we are and who God is and then make an effort to close that gap. Do you know, ultimately, the only way that we can close that gap, and we just saw that and what Paul was talking about, was for us to surrender our lives to him. To admit that we're broken, to admit that we're sinners, to admit that we have fault, and that we can't save ourselves, but that we recognize that he can. And so today, we're gonna give you opportunity to do that. We call it getting saved, coming to Jesus, starting your Jesus journey. And so today, if you say, Sean, I am spiritually lost and I need to be rescued. We're gonna give you opportunity to do that. Here's how. In just a moment, I'm gonna pray some lines in a prayer, and then I'm gonna pause. And when I pause, if you repeat those words and you mean them in your heart, the Bible says you will be saved. Everything you've ever done in your life up to this point will have been erased, and you will begin again. So if that's you and you say, Sean, I need this, I need to be saved to receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Would you repeat these words after me? Say, Jesus, I'm a sinner, but I'm sorry. I believe you can change me. I believe you can save me. Will you forgive me? Will you come into my life, make me different, make me new, be my Lord, be my Savior, in Jesus' name. 
Friend, if you prayed that prayer, everything you've ever done wrong, poof, gone. You begin again. And we would love the opportunity to help you with this new journey of your life away from where you are toward who God wants you to be, which is more like Jesus. So if you'll just reach out to us, if you'll just message us, if you'll just indicate the fact that you have received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, we would love the opportunity to walk this road with you. But that's not it. There's some of you who are watching this who you're a Jesus guy or you're a Jesus girl, but there's a void in your life. That, that, that void has been exposed by this tragedy that we're going through, by this drama that we're enduring. You know, trauma only reveals who you really are. And I wonder if you're watching this and you say, Sean, I have been loving with strings attached. You know, the love of Jesus is a love with no expectation. If you say, Sean, I want that formula, the formula to love with no expectation of it being returned, I wanna pray for you. So God, we love you, we honor you. Thank you for my friends. God, I pray right now, heal their hearts, ease their minds, breathe life into them, help us love, with no expectation, in Jesus' name, amen.
This moment doesn't have to end now. The things that you're thinking about, you're questioning, you're mulling over right now, have a conversation with someone. Call someone up and talk about this, or if you're with someone right now, you could go to lifechurchgreenbay.com and download the discussion questions to prompt even more. You'll find these discussion questions will help you whether you're new to Jesus or you've known Jesus for decades. They will help you on your Jesus journey.